Hello Internet, friends old and new, welcome back to the channel. We were working on this uh, lovely Zenith 40T. We uh, last saw it uh, with a dial that uh, was quite damaged that we have to uh, refinish. So we're going to see how that turned out. Let's uh, first start with the movement. As always, the first couple of things we have to do is get the mainspring back into the barrel and then we have to do the shock settings. If you're doing the mainsprings often, then having this type of mainspring winder is a really invaluable time saver. Not only saving time, but you also avoid the risk of uh, damaging the hairspring if you put it in by hand. So we put some grease uh, in the barrel. You can also grease the mainspring itself. The only thing we need to do now is uh, line up the end of uh, the mainspring with the notch in the barrel. And then we're ready for the barrel arbor. Easiest way is to put the hook into the eye of the mainspring and then squeeze it down. If you follow the curvature of the mainspring, it makes it a little bit easier. But it can be bothersome anyway. If your mainspring is of the DBH type or uh, any type that has uh, sort of a flange coming up, very important to make sure those are aligned with the corresponding cutouts in the barrel and the lid. Alright, with the barrel in place, we can put that away. Put some 9010 on the end stones. And then we put the chaton on top of them. So we've gotten used to this way of turning the chatons, just flicking them up and down. We can of course also do that in a different way. And again the 40T is a simple movement. Just uh, three hands and that's it. But it's very well made and it's a uh, beautiful movement. We talked a little bit about the Zenith as a brand last time. It is one of those brands that somehow managed to be a little bit undervalued, even though it's a very expensive brand nowadays. The El Primero is uh, one of the most famous uh, movements and watch series, of course, ever. And I think a serious watch collection uh, should uh, definitely consider an uh, El Primero. And that doesn't even have to be a Zenith watch. Of course, the Rolex Daytona 16520 has an El Primero movement. Perhaps one of the more attractive versions of the El Primero is the uh, Open series, where you see the escapement uh, through the dial. Something that sometimes can be a little bit tacky, but I think with the El Primero it looks uh, just fantastic. I believe the Open series uh, was started just after uh, Zenith was taken over by uh, LVMH. 
back in the late 90s as part of a consolidation that has happened uh, over the last couple of decades. Before we continue that discussion, let's uh, get the fourth wheel in place. One of which has small seconds or sub-seconds. It's uh, the fourth wheel that uh, rotates uh, once a minute. And yes, I did say once a minute. A little bit too used to saying zenith, I think. So we oiled the uh, shoulder of uh, that long pivot. And we also have to be very careful uh, when we get that pivot into and through the hole. A little bit the same with the center wheel. But for that one, we put a little bit thick royal on. So HB 1300 or D5 at the shoulder. And you know you're working on a quality movement when things just fall in place like this. Then we can put the barrel bridge on as well. But given that we have a setting lever screw, we need to put that one first. Put a little bit D5 on it so it rotates uh, smoothly. So one thing that might be uh, interesting to note, this watch doesn't have any jewels for the center wheel. So it's just a bearing in the brass plate or bridge, or bridge and plate, but it's still 17 jewels. And that's of course because there's a capstone also on the escape wheel on both uh, sides. And that's also the case for the chronometer version. It has exactly the same jeweling. So uh, extra capstones for the escape wheel, but uh, no jewels for the uh, center wheel. Okay, rewinding him a little bit. We were talking about uh, consolidation. As uh, you might know, there are three main groups uh, running the Swiss uh, watch industry. Zenith is now positioned as the top luxury band in LVMH. So Louis Vuitton, Moi Hennessy which is a general luxury goods uh, group. And the other two groups are uh, Richemont and uh, the Swatch group. And Richemont is probably the most uh, high-end group, where you have brands like uh, Vacheron Constantin. We will uh, service Vacheron next, actually, in the next uh, video, or. Uh, one of the next two videos at least. But uh, Richemont also has uh, brands like IWC, Cartier, Jaeger, Le Coulter, Piaget. It's a very high end. So I would say that uh, Richemont and LVMH aren't really in the news that much, at least not uh, negatively. Whereas in uh, watchmaking uh, circles, uh, the Swatch Group, uh, and in particular uh, ETA, which is part of the Swatch Group, has been very negatively viewed the last few years. And the main reason for that is that uh, ETA decided in 2015 that they would stop selling parts to any company that's not part of the uh, Swatch Group. And as um, a lot of people probably know, 
Etta has been the main supplier to the whole watch industry with their 2824 and uh, 2892 movements being uh, like the workhorses of uh, a lot of brands including of course a lot of the brands within LVMH and uh, Richemont so they've been uh, viewed very unfavorably by uh, independent watchmakers with good reason I think the reason ETA or Swatch Group cited for stopping this is that it's unhealthy for the watch industry to rely so much on one single supplier, which is true. But it's also true that it's a very conscious policy to force uh, consumers to service watches and have everything done at uh, authorized uh, dealers, authorized uh, repair service centers which charge very high prices. So I'm pretty sure it's more of a profit-driven decision than a consideration for the rest of the watchmaking industry decision. That said, it has sparked more innovation. It has forced manufacturers to step up. Of course, part of that is that Salita as taking over as the uh, main supplier of movements which coincidentally are 2824 and 2892 clones so I'm not sure the end result is uh, that much different but all in all uh, consolidation is just part of uh, any business and industry that will always happen Small brands becoming successful and then being bought by bigger brands. And while we've been uh, babbling, uh, we've uh, pretty much finished the Achilles works. Again, no complication here, it's very straightforward. putting on the cannon pinion before we put on the minute wheel and we're also remembering to oil the third wheel pivot under the minute wheel you can sneak the oiler in after you put the minute wheel on but uh, then you risk getting some oil into the teeth of the minute wheel spreading the grease and oil a little bit and also for the cannon pinion okay in the meantime we uh, fix or dropped the pallet fork We'll put that in place and get that little uh, bridge on top of it. Also here, very important to be careful that we uh, know that we have the pivots in the holes. And we of course never oil the pallet fork. So it's actually a good question. If we're not supposed to oil uh, the pallet fork, then why do the jewels have oil sinks? And the simple answer is that uh, that type of jewel is uh, readily available. So instead of having a separate jewel type 
you just reuse one with an oil sink. Speaking of oil sinks, let's uh, oil the jewels, including this uh, capstone. In general, when you have these uh, die shock settings, uh, I would actually advise not to take uh, the jewel out, but just uh, clean it and oil it from underneath. They can be tricky to get uh, back on, and if they ping off and you lose them, you will never ever be able to uh, buy another one. And if you still decide to take it off and you do um, ping it and it gets lost then uh, you can put in a kif uh, flex trier that uh, will be a solution but the best thing is to not mess with them in the first place all right as soon as we fiddle this one back in we can check that the uh, pallet fork flicks as it should. And then we'll put the balance in. Oh, that's always nice to see. All right. All right, let's uh, oil the rest of the pivots. We use 90-10 on the third wheel, fourth wheel, escape wheel, and D5 on the center wheel, or HP 1300. Then all we need to do is give the watch a good wind, and then we're gonna time it. And we talked about the beat error before, and the 40T actually has an adjustable stud carrier. So you see it moves when we touch it with the screwdriver. And that is very convenient uh, when we go to the time grapher. That means that we can uh, adjust the beat error very easily. Simply by moving that uh, stud carrier. It's always a little bit of uh, trying and failing, but uh, by adjusting it back and forth, we uh, can easily get it very close to or at zero. The beat there might uh, fluctuate a little bit in the different positions, but it shouldn't fluctuate by more than maybe 0 0.2 milliseconds. Much more than that, and uh, there's something wrong, and we'll have to investigate that. So we're getting the watch to about where we want to. Running just a few seconds fast with a nice slow beat rate. This is a quality movement, so that uh, is not surprising. All right, with the watch running nicely, let's uh, put the hour wheel back on, and then we can put on the refinished dial. We talked a little bit about refinishing uh, last time. In general, it's much more uh, desirable for a watch to be fully original. So with the original uh, case uh, not being polished and with the original dial, of course. But if the original dial is too damaged, then the better choice is to refinish it. Of course, the casual buyer of a watch he or she might actually like a refinished dial better because it looks nicer, if you will, or newer. 
So uh, you definitely see some uh, sellers selling refinished watches and asking very high prices. Not my preference, but uh, it does happen. When watch dial is refinished, like this one, we want it to look as close to the original as possible, of course. Even as a professional, you want to uh, actually having to look closely at the dial to see if it's been refinished or not. So I think this is a good job. The other question then becomes, now that we have a, let's say, almost new looking dial, do we want the rest of the watch to look new as well? I actually don't think so. I think it's better to let the rest of the watch then stay uh, original, uh, not polishing the case too much, not do too much with the hands besides cleaning them a little bit. I think that reflects better on the watch. But I'm sure there are differences of opinion on that as well. For the some seconds hand, it's kind of the opposite of a normal sweep seconds hand. That the danger here is not that the sweep seconds um, bumps into the minute hand that the sub-seconds hand actually bumps into the hour hand. So we need to make sure that the sub-seconds hand is parallel to the dial and not too high. Of course not too low either so it scrubs on the dial. It's not uncommon to see that there's a small ring of wear around the sub-seconds hand. All right, so we put a new crystal on, or rather a crystal on. Then we can case the movement. And we need to have a look at the crown as well. It's not so easy to see from uh, the video, but uh, the case is actually uh, rose gold. So with a little bit more copper in it than uh, normal yellow gold. So the crown that's currently on it is uh, not original, and it's also the wrong uh, shade of gold, it's a more standard yellow gold. So for the crown, the first question is uh, what uh, style of crown do we want? Originally this uh, watch would uh, likely have a rather slim crown, sort of the style that's on it now, but maybe a little bit bigger. So we discussed this with uh, the owner and he wanted a little bit uh, bulkier crown. So ultimately we ended up with a scallop type crown. For a crown there are three major measurements. Two of them are obviously the diameter and the height of the crown. And the third is the thread diameter. The most common thread diameter is uh, 0 0.9 millimeters, but the old crown is actually 1.0, while the new crown is 0 0.9. So obviously a 1.0 stem will not fit into a 0 0.9 crown. So what we're going to do is first of all uh, clean up the threads a little bit. And then we're going to have to put in a stem extender that translates the threads from 1.0 to 0 0.9. This is not complicated work, it's uh, just important to be diligent. 
It's a very important concept in uh, whenever you're working with metal or wood for that sake. That you can always take more off, but you cannot always add anything. So of course with the stem extender, the stem becomes way too long for the case. So that means we need to cut it. And we don't want to cut it too much. Which means that we have to do it a couple of times extra instead and cut a little bit every time. So we make sure we don't cut so much that the stem becomes too short. It sounds like we're erasing something, but we're actually filing the stem end a little bit. So it becomes flat. And once we have the flat end, we round it off a little bit. And of course, before we put the uh, stem into the stem extender and the crown onto the stem, we put some uh, Loctite on the both of them. And when we finally find that we have the right length, that the crown is like 0 0.1 millimeter off the case, so it doesn't rub against it. We put a little bit extra grease on the stem. And then we can put the crown and the stem back in. The final thing to note about this watch is that uh, the case has these uh, fixed uh, lugs, male lugs if you will. So we'll have to put on uh, these female uh, spring bars. It's also a little bit of a problem with the strap itself. Because to get the strap on those uh, fixed lugs, you will have to uh, squeeze it a little bit. So if you have a strap with a very uh, reinforced tube for the spring bars, then uh, that's not going to work on this type of uh, lug. You don't see this type of lugs uh, very often, but they uh, do occur, especially on older watches. And we we'll see this strap also has a silver buckle, so we're going to replace that with a golden one. And with that we can put the watch on the wrist and see what it looks like. Obviously the dial is uh, refinished but uh, you cannot really see it very easily when it's professionally done. It just looks very nice and not uh, fake. We polished the case very lightly and uh, we cleaned the hands a little bit so that the end impression is of a vintage watch in very fine condition. Thanks for watching. We're going to put up new videos shortly. So if you haven't done so, clicking like and subscribe will really help us. Until next time, ta-ta.